Welcome to the Opportunity Zones podcast. I'm Jimmy Atkinson. Last April, the Opportunity Zones Improvement, Transparency, and Extension Act was introduced into the House and Senate. This was bicameral and also bipartisan legislation. The reform legislation was co-sponsored by Senators Cory Booker and Tim Scott and House Representatives Ron Kind and Mike Kelly. Unfortunately, the legislation did not pass at the end of 2022, as I had predicted, uh, but we're going to dive into a discussion today of what's next with Opportunity Zone reform legislation. When might it get it reintroduced? Will Opportunity Zones get extended? Will they get reformed? We hope to look into some answers to those questions today. And joining me on the show today to discuss what may be next with OZ reform legislation are John Shreddy and Peter Lawrence from Novogratic and Company. John is a CPA and partner at Novogratic, and he also leads the Novogratic Opportunity Zones Working Group. Peter is the Director of Public Policy and Government Relations at Novogratic. John and Peter, I uh, really appreciate both of you taking some time to come on the podcast today. Welcome. How are you doing? Doing great. I uh, appreciate being here as well, Jimmy. Absolutely, Jimmy. It's a, a great time to talk to you to start off the year. I look forward to the discussion. Perfect, guys. Uh, well, John, I'll turn to you first. Uh, we're going to get into legislation in a minute. But uh, first, I know a lot of our high net worth uh, investors who listen to the show are very familiar with Novogratic. But in case anyone uh, may not be familiar with Novogratic and the work that you do in Opportunity Zones, can you quickly give a background on, on Novogratic, who the firm is, and, and what you guys specialize in? Sure. So, uh Novogratz and Company, we've been around for over 30 years. Um, we primarily focus on community development finance, and that includes tax credits uh, such as low-income housing tax credits, renewable energy credits, new market tax credits. Um, but we, we got involved early um, in the Opportunity Zone uh, legislation, actually before it was actually enacted, and uh, and I've been active in it since the beginning. So we work with uh, lots of funds and developers and intermediaries around the incentive. And it's been uh, been a lot of fun, Jimmy. Excellent. Uh, well, let's let's talk legislation in a couple more minutes here. But first, I wanted to contextualize how big the marketplace is for Opportunity Zones, specifically how much equity has been raised to date through qualified opportunity funds, which then deploy capital into different Opportunity Zone investments. Uh, John, I'll turn to you again. Novogratic is is well known in the industry for the work that you do tracking different qualified opportunity funds. I believe you're tracking uh, about 1,500 or so different qualified opportunity funds so far since inception and tracking how much equity has been raised to date. You just came out uh, about a week or so ago with your 2022 report. Uh, so what can you tell us about what Novogratic does with regards to QOF tracking? and how much equity has been raised so far. Sure, so back in early 2019, we realized there wasn't, you know, there's no reporting um, required um, for opportunity funds and the fundraising that they receive. And we uh, realized that any sort of tax data would be behind. And so we started a survey um, where we um, reach out to funds. Now these are multi-investor funds, so it's not your, proprietary funds that are sort of sponsor managed, but multi-investor funds. Um, and um, you know, over the years, we've uh, accumulated data from uh, 1,661 funds that we're tracking, but only 1,274 of those have reported fundraising data. And um, for this year, 2022, um, we show equity raised of 9.7 billion um, and 34 billion since the beginning. So $34 billion in raised since we started tracking these funds. Um, we think that the number is three to four times that, or at least we always said we thought the number was three or four times that amount just from anecdotal evidence. Yeah, That's incredible. Well, I want to take one minute to to share my screen briefly here and, and actually just kind of show everybody who may be watching on our YouTube channel how this data looks if you compare uh, qualified opportunity fundraising to that of other different alternative investment structures uh, 
Um, I'm using data that that your firm, John, have reported. Um, Novogratic is the orange number here uh, for qualified opportunity funds. You guys are, are then again, this is just through 2022 or just for the year 2022. Here's that $9.7 billion numbers that you're tracking. Uh, we're, I'm, I've then multiplied that by three to arrive at $29 billion total qualified opportunity fund equity raising in 22. We don't really know. And we probably won't find out for at least another 18 months or so, I guess, until the 2022 data are available. But here's how qualified opportunity funds, which I consider uh, a part of the alternative investing universe, kind of compares to some of these different alternative structures. It's right up there with non-traded REITs and, and it blows DSTs out of the water. That's a, a, a special type of 1031 exchange, and, and it's 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 considerably higher than interval funds and non-traded BDCs as well. Just had to uh, geek out there for a moment for for my my fans that like these different alternative investment structures. John and Peter, there, uh, John. Any any thoughts on on how QOFs compare to to other alternative structures or or other programs? You know, I think it's interesting to look at the quarterly data. So we, when you look at our fundraising report and you look at the quarterly data, it had a really strong first quarter. Actually, 41% of the money, $4 billion was raised in that first quarter. And then it sort of slowly trickled down to where the last quarter was only 1.4 billion. And you compare that to other years, the last quarter was the big quarter, you know, end of the year investing. So I think it signals, um, you know, the macro economy. Um, in that, you know, folks uh, didn't have the gains. And you look at 2022, stock market being down about 20%, real estate sales down probably 10%, uh, M&A activity down 40%. I mean, that's a big episodic gain that, um, you know, they fund a lot of these quaffs. And so you look at that and say, well, that sort of makes sense. We have less gains. Um, and so there's going to be less investment as we get through the year. Um when you look at that alternative report, I actually read that report. Um, the they talked about the fourth quarter being fairly dismal. A lot mm -hmm. of withdrawals and uh, non-traded REITs. You know, folks kind of worried about the net asset value going down um, as a result of higher interest rates and the like. Plus, they had alternative investments now, and in, you know, interest rates um, where they could store their cash until equilibrium hits the markets, right? And so they. You know, I think a lot of that has to do with it, but um, I think we're consistent there with the alternative investments. Um, alternative investments are, in, you know, they have a lot of foreign money in them. Um, they don't need gains, so you know, I think it's it's a it's a little easier to to uh, invest in in those assets than it is opportunity zones. Oh yeah, for sure, it is. Yeah. Uh, there, there's less of a, a hurdle to have to that you have to clear, of course, and. And as you mentioned, you know, a lot of foreign money can pour into those other programs where that's not really part of the Opportunity Zone program. Uh, but I guess the tax incentive of Opportunity Zones draws quite a bit of money in such that Opportunity Zones are kind of able to compete with those other types of private uh, alternative investment structures that we just laid out there. And John, you were referencing uh, the report in the DI wire from a few weeks ago. I'll make sure we link to that report in the show notes for this page, but it compares those different numbers from Robert A. Stanger and company uh, that uh, are not Opportunity Zone specific, but help us compare Opportunity Zones to those other types of structures. Well, I wanted to uh, turn our attention now to the, the bulk of today's episode, which will be on Opportunity Zone reform legislation. We've just painted the picture of how big the marketplace is for Opportunity Zones and how crucial it is really that this program get extended and reformed so it can help further improve uh, the lives of the residents of these different neighborhoods that are, have been slated as Opportunity Zones. We can help drive more economic catalyzing efforts into Opportunity Zones, because otherwise, unfortunately, Opportunity Zones are set to expire uh, at the end of 2026. So, Peter, I want to turn to you now. Uh, you're our, you're going to be the star of the show here for the, for the bulk of the remainder of this episode. Uh, 2022, Opportunity Zone reform legislation, unfortunately, did not pass in last session's Congress. How did the end of the year play out exactly? And, and why was OZ reform not included in the year-end omnibus bill? 
Well, Jimmy, thanks for the question. And I, I think I want to start off by making clear to your listeners that the opportunity zone legislation wasn't specifically excluded, uh, unlike other related tax legislation. Unfortunately, uh, a whole slew of uh, you know potential tax legislation was held off, and uh, that was sort of somewhat of a, a minor surprise uh, because, in many respects, the stars had been aligned. So you, you said that you were predicting that it would be. Uh, I ha- thought there was positive momentum as well uh, towards uh, having uh, you know uh, community development tax legislation included. Uh, because I think you know one thing we were looking for was would there be uh, an omnibus spending bill for fiscal year 2023? You know, Congress every year needs to make sure the federal government is funded, uh, and often the case instead of passing 12 individual spending bills by the you know deadline of the fiscal year on uh, September 30th, what ends up happening is. Congress passes a what's called a continuing resolution to give them time to negotiate. And uh, in order to save time, they package all 12 uh, uh, spending bills together into one piece of legislation and pass it you know, in November, December. Uh, and that type of legislation is uh, a ideal sort of what we call a legislative vehicle uh, for tax legislation because it's hard to... Uh, bring up tax legislation on its own. Uh, um, And so the uh, uh, having that uh, opportunity begin to sort of come together and we'd seen first that, uh, you know, President Biden and the leaders of Congress uh, came together after the election and agreed, yes, we wanted to negotiate an omnibus spending bill. They first agreed to the sort of top line number, what's what defense and uh, would get and non-defense would get, and that usually bodes well. And sure enough, uh, they finally did strike an agreement on omnibus legislation. And the next step would be, at that point, Treasury just or the leadership of, of of Congress to say, okay, now we can negotiate the tax pieces. And uh, we were getting towards the end of the the uh, finish line there before Congress was going to leave for the holidays, and. Uh, for uh, a variety of reasons, leadership decided, okay, we're not we're not going to include anything tax. Uh, now, some of folks have pointed out, well, there was this retirement reform package that was included, but that really was something entirely separate. It has been it was the longstanding effort of Congress to reform uh, retirement, uh, um, and there had been a previous sort of package. Uh, um, enacted two years ago, and this was sort of a follow-on to address all the other items that weren't addressed in that first package. And it, they had a House version and a Senate version that had already passed, uh, and so they were kind of already very close to finishing the negotiations, and and uh, leadership said it would it's okay to include that in there, but we're not going to include anything else. Uh, and, and, that, and I think the primary reason why they broke down is because there was this mismatch of what uh, Democrats and Republicans wanted. I mean, Democrats wanted to get as much of an expansion of the child tax credit that was originally included in the American Rescue Plan that was in effect essentially for 2021 added, uh, while Republicans often wanted three sort of very broad uh, uh, business-related tax extenders uh, included, and they really didn't, uh, they weren't congruent, and they just ran out of time, I think, to be able to seriously talk about what might be possible. Uh, and so they deferred the entire conversation uh, to the next uh, Congress. So I think that's sort of the dynamic. I don't think uh, Opportunity Zone stakeholders should read anything into that Congress doesn't want to do Opportunity Zone legislation. I think uh, they're still an appetite there if another opportunity, another window were to open up. Uh, And uh, unfortunately, we do have a challenging environment uh, this year. Uh, And uh, I'm happy to go into that, but I guess I'll just take a a moment there so you can have a 
follow-up question. Yeah, sure. No, that's that's really crucial for you to point out that this wasn't that opportunity zones failed to get extended. It's that a lot of different uh, tax legislation failed to become a priority, I guess, at, at the very uh, end of the last session of Congress. The, the finish line kind of came up on them a little bit too soon, snuck up on them, and they just weren't able, both Democrats and Republicans just weren't able to come to the table to negotiate on on anything uh, tax wise at the end of the year. There were numerous different priorities and 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 different programs and tax legislation that that did not end up making the cut. And opportunity zones are a small part of that. Uh, Peter, you also mentioned to me the other day that there was a ni- another issue, uh, particularly on the the Republican side during the lame duck session where there was a lack of clear leadership. And, and we know now that Kevin McCarthy did ev- eventually win the uh, Speaker of the House position uh, for the Republicans on, on the House side. But uh, that was that was not clear that that was going to happen um, for the first several days of this session of Congress. It was quite a contentious vote, as our listeners and viewers recall from last month, I'm sure. And and that kind of goes back into the lame duck session from last year, too. He, it wasn't really clear that he necessarily had the votes. Can you expand on that a little bit for us? Absolutely. So you know, normally when it comes to negotiating high profile stuff like tax legislation, uh, you often refer to the four corners being, you know, the House Speaker, the, the House Minority Leader, uh, the Senate Majority Leader, and the Senate Minority Leader. And they all come together and they negotiate the really important stuff. Uh, together. And unfortunately, there really was a huge question about who the top uh, uh, House Republican would be uh, in November, December. I mean, it uh, did take a while, but uh, House Republicans did uh, secure the you know, votes in the election uh, to take power. But uh, uh, Kevin McCarthy had not ne- nailed down the necessary uh, majority of all uh, the House members, and it took a long time, 15 rounds of voting for him to get there. And I think that w- did represent a bit of a leadership vacuum. And not only that, but also there was uncertainty on who was going to lead the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, the former uh, Republican ranking member, Kevin Brady, was retiring, uh, and there was a three-way race uh, to determine who would uh, replace him and potentially become chair in a you know Republican controlled house uh, uh, you know a race between Jason Smith in Missouri, Ver Buchanan of Florida, and Adrian Smith in Nebraska hadn't been resolved yet. So there really wasn't a, a true partner in sort of one quarter of Congress uh, that uh, uh, could negotiate on taxes. And I think that also led to a decision to defer. Um, you know, there was, the clarity in co- in terms of who was be leading on appropriations on spending. Kay Granger was the ranking member and she's now chair of appropriations. So she was kind of already in place to negotiate that piece. But there wasn't uh, a counterpart uh, uh, as the top Republican on ways and means. And I think that uh, contributed as well to uh, 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 not deferring the whole conversation on tax policy. Sure. Yeah. You were missing one of the four corners, uh, so to speak, as, as you mentioned, and, and uh, ways and means wasn't clear either. Uh, I have a fun fact. Uh, Kay Granger is my uh, congresswoman here from Fort Worth. So just wanted to plug that real quick. Um, well, let's. Uh, let, 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 so, so what's happening this year now? Uh, we, we still have tax legislation that needs to be worked on uh, by both sides, uh, the, the Democrats and the Republicans. But we've had a pretty slow start to this new session of Congress, right, Peter? We we just mentioned that it took 15 rounds of voting just to figure out who the the speaker would be, and then what are some of the other dominant issues right now which are preventing uh, tax legislation from bubbling up to the surface? So you're right; it's been a uh, a slow start uh, to the Congress, given that uncertainty on uh, leadership, uh, and only recently did Jason Smith beat out Vern Buchanan and Adrian Smith to become uh, chair of Ways and Means Committee. And only recently did they make uh, committee assignments for both uh, Ways and Means and at the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, 
Uh, so only, and then actually uh, uh, as a time of this recording, yesterday uh, was the first Ways and Means hearing uh, uh, of the year. So it, it, it's definitely a, a slow start. Uh, and I think the other major issue that's going to sort of dominate, suck up the oxygen uh, uh, in Congress uh, this year is what to do about the uh, debt limits, um, which uh, has been something that Congress in the past has uh, considered, uh, but also there been whenever there's been a change in power, uh, it could it has always prompt some challenges in getting uh, uh, Congress to 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 agree uh, uh, to increase the nation's debt limit. So on on January nineteenth, we you know Treasury's borrowing did hit. Uh, Thirty-one point four trillion dollars, which is the debt limit, and the reason why we haven't had challenges since then is because Treasury is, uh, as it has in the past, uh, has employed what they call extraordinary measures, a variety of accounting uh, and various other actions to uh, not exceed that thirty-one point four trillion dollars, and in her letter. Uh, to Congress, Secretary Let Yellen did say that Treasury would be able to continue to do this at least until early June. And uh, independent experts uh, that uh, analyze the debt limit suggest that we probably have until mid-July uh, before we reach the, what's called the X date, which is the date on which Treasury runs out of uh, uh, you know this ability to use extraordinary measures to avoid when, when, when the government runs out of money essentially in right? essence <laughs> yeah, they have to b- borrow some more on the, na- yeah. the international debt markets to to be able to go forward so uh absolutely that's that is uh um what we're looking at and uh i, I think uh uh there's been a lot of chatter and discussion in these first couple of weeks about that uh you know uh, uh president biden and uh, uh, Speaker McCarthy did have a meeting last week to, to start off uh, the discussion, uh, but it's going to be a particularly fraught uh, negotiations. You know, uh, President Biden is sort of starting off with his position that he doesn't think uh, uh, there should be any link to the nation's delimit. It's too important, uh, and uh, it represents what Congress has already authorized in terms of uh, of spending and, and tax, and so. Uh, it's sort of the, the the metaphor is is that the credit card payment is running up uh, things that have already been authorized, and it's time to pay you that. Uh, and it, do, it doesn't want to put a, put place any conditions because for fear that spooks the credit rating agencies and and uh, the uh, nation's uh, debt rating. And so uh, that's his initial position. But uh, Speaker McCarthy equally is staking out his position that they're they're uh, a, a, a co-equal uh, member of the government and it, they were elected in November and uh, they want their policy preference uh, expressed in terms of having some sort of form of uh, uh, spending uh, a constraint and we'll see what happens uh, uh, you know about a decade ago what we saw, was uh, the uh, uh, Budget Control Act of 2011, which uh, placed uh, spending caps and co- created a, a super committee to try to find uh, deficit reduction. Uh, it's not clear if we'll see something similar this year, but it's definitely, I think I would be surprised if there was a, a clean increase with no conditions. I just don't think uh, uh, that uh, Speaker McCarthy would survive that. I mean, remember, he had 15 rounds. Part of the reason why it took him so long is that uh, you know some uh, members of the Republican conference were don't were you know wanted to make sure McCarthy held to his principles in this uh, 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 negotiations and and uh, make sure that he comes away with at least something. Uh, and so I think if he didn't. Uh, he would be at risk of of not be, being speaker anymore. Mm-hmm. So uh, I do think that there will be something, but it's it's going to be a messy process, and it's going to sort of take up, I think, uh, 
the bandwidth of uh, um, you know the Ways and Means and Senate Finance Committee, since that debt limit is uh, in its jurisdiction, uh, and there those committees will be sort of being part of the negotiation on what uh, should be done going forward. Right. So probably no tax legislation um, until that gets resolved. That's a much larger, uh, more urgent issue for for the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee and Congress in general to tackle in the meantime. So when might a window open for tax legislation and, and possibly some OZ reform legislation to to get packaged into a tax bill? Right. So, you know, I mentioned that independent experts suggest the X date is mid-July. Uh, we've heard from Congress some initial suggestions that there will should be a, a short-term increase or at least uh, suspension of the debt limit uh, until September 30th so that we would line up with the end of the fiscal year. And so everything could be you know, all part of the one big negotiations to fund the federal government address the debt limit all together. Uh, and so given that, and I think that that, that, that seems to be uh, there are a decent chance of that happening. Um, and because it does once again, give more time uh, for Congress. And, they, and there are some sort of, there's a relationship here, right? Because uh, if spending is curtailed if for fiscal year 2024, uh, that might be what the Republicans say they got out of a debt limit negotiation. So uh, it's not inconceivable that would happen. But what, if we get into that situation, then we're sort of already in the context of October, November, which is the time frame when often they start negotiation on your end tax legislation. Tax legislation is very often considered at the year end, given that we you know tax on a calendar year basis, right? And so Congress often wants to set the policy for how you're going to claim your taxes at the end of the year for the uh, upcoming filing year. So I wouldn't be surprised uh, if that's when we uh, start again negotiating. And remember, we still have all these unresolved issues from negotiation from last year's year end negotiation. So I think there's still very much um, a, uh, a relevant issue. And there are new things too, like the 1099 issue uh, that I think many members on a bipartisan issue want to sort of reform. I mean, I think the $600 threshold is, uh, it, you know, which is coming into effect this year uh, uh, until IRS decided to postpone it for a year, uh, you know, is a ripe issue uh, that Congress will want to address. So in addition to all the various items they couldn't get to at the end of last year. Right. Okay. So some some tax legislation uh, might come into into being toward the end of the year, depending on how negotiations go in in the fourth quarter. It sounds like maybe maybe November or December toward the end of the year, uh, we might see something get passed. Uh, the opportunity zone piece of that, the legislation that was introduced last April is gone now. Essentially, it needs to be reintroduced to this new session of Congress. Uh, do you anticipate that the reform legislation from last April might get reintroduced verbatim as is, or might there be some tweaks to it? And and how do you see that getting re reintroduced and, and, and when? Great question. Uh, and, you know, typically uh, legislation always gets uh, tweaked to address with uh, dates and things like that. Uh, but there is sort of two different schools of thought when it comes to these situations. Uh, it, you know, the and, the, and the, there will need to be some sort of uh, reevaluation of the situation because one of the four leads, uh, Ron Kind, uh, from uh, uh, the uh, former House Democratic lead from Wisconsin, uh, has retired. So a new House Democratic lead needs to be identified. Uh, and, you know, the, the two schools of philosophy is reintroduce the same bill except for even the various date tweaks. Uh, 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 because that way it's not that, that much easier to get all the members that co-sponsored in the last Congress to uh, co-sponsor it again. If they're essentially, it's the same legislation they supported uh, in the previous con uh, Congress. But, you know, there also is, I think, uh, uh, a thought that, you know, whenever you reintroduce legislation, it always gives an opportunity to think, what are new some new things? 
and maybe some new pro proposals that would help increase the uh, co-sponsor support. Uh, and so I think this is something that the leads are going through. Remember, sure we're going a slow start to Congress, so it's not yet you know, fully uh, engaged in that point. Uh, but I expect sometime uh, in uh, you know, uh, late March, April, potentially into May, you know, the bills will be reintroduced and there may be a tweaks. So, you know, we at the No Regratic Opportunity Zone Working Group have been uh, working on some suggested uh, uh, changes that, you know, could be considered. That's, you know, one thing uh, that, you know, they, those new ideas might be incorporated uh, or it, we may, the leads might decide, you know, let's keep it the same legislation essentially that to, to maximize chances of getting co-sponsors and and you know those new ideas always can be introduced as separate legislation at a minimum i think th there were a number of technical corrections that the opportunity zone working group came up with um in conjunction with the economic innovation group so at a minimum that would be introduced and and i think what a lot of folks are hopeful of and it wouldn't be too heavy of a lift is that the opportunity zone designation, which actually expires in 2028, um, that that's pushed forward a bit um, to really line up with this bill because this bill extends the investment date to 28 uh, or capital gain recognition date to, to 28. And so because you have 180 days and partnerships even have longer, um, 28 gains may not be able to be invested at that opportunity zone designation isn't moved. And so we're hopeful that, uh, like I said, it wouldn't be a heavy lift. We're hopeful that, that that gets added as well. And we'd like to see it extended out a little further so folks sure. can reinvest if needed to and things of that nature. Sure. Yeah. That's a minor technical de detail that shouldn't go unnoticed. And uh, yeah. Yeah, hopefully hopefully yeah. it's a hopefully that's an easy fix though. Um, is it possible that, that uh, last year's legislation that I've referred to um, called for the 26th end date to get pushed to 28. Is it possible we see that extended to, to 29 maybe if in this iteration or, or do you think they'll stick with 28? It's a great question. Uh, you know, I think, you know, part of the issue always is as you push it out further, it increases the score. And so that that is, I think, you know, uh, uh, something to keep in mind uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the more something costs, the harder it is to enact. Uh, and, you know, the other aspect I think we all should just keep aware of is how a bill, what the bill is, is introduced doesn't mean that you're fixed on that when they actually get to a legislative vehicle. So they may introduce a bill keeping the 28th date to start with, but when they come to the actual hard negotiations in, in November, December, if there's an opportunity to make it 29, they'll, they, I'm sure... Uh, the leads will push to do that. But I, I, it's not necessary that it be included in the, in the bill as reduced. Well, the bill actually uh, reduced the investment term for the 5% incentive to six years. Mm -hmm. um, and we won't have six years. <laughs> and so they may move to 29 just to, in, so that we can include that 5% or they'll make it just fifteen percent for five years, you know. But uh, yeah, that, it's an interesting technical issue that they'll have to deal with. Yeah, that's another that's another interesting wrinkle there. And and who's pushing this legislation right now? Is it is it Senator Booker or Scott or is it is it House Rep Mike Kelly? Uh, you you mentioned that uh, that wrong kind is 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 out right now. Right. So the, yeah, we do expect the those three uh, uh, members, uh, you know, Senators uh, Booker and and Scott, Tim Scott, uh, and uh, Representative Mike Kelly from uh, Pennsylvania to, to remain. Uh, and, you know, Mike Kelly would go from being the lead co-sponsor to being the lead sponsor, given that Republicans are now the majority. That's generally, uh, you know, whenever you have bipartisan bills, the, the lead sponsor is usually the majority party. Um, so, uh, but I think, uh, you know, there has already been efforts to identify uh, you know, uh, which House uh, Ways and Means uh, um, uh, Democrat it will be willing to step up and become the new uh, lead co-sponsor. Uh, but I just, I don't think it's yet public yet, and uh, hopefully it will be uh, relatively soon. Good. Uh, so we, we've identified some of the, I suppose, structural 
obstacles to getting OZ reform legislation through. It didn't happen last year. Uh, this year, it seems like one of the biggest obstacles in place right now is the debt limit, getting that issue resolved. And then there are various other intricacies of just negotiating uh, tax legislation. Uh, but, but, but besides those structural obstacles, what, what do you identify as or who do you identify as being possibly the biggest obstacles to OZ reform legislation eventually passing and becoming law? Right. Well, you know, I do think that first, I, I mean, sort of do, I do feel duty bound to mention that there will needs to be the agreement from leadership to say, yes, we want to do tax legislation at the year end because that was lacking last year, right? Uh, and, so, and it may lack again this year, right? Could, could lack yeah. again for a reason. They may not be able to say, come to agreement on having, yes, we got to negotiate something. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a key first step. But sure. assuming that happens, there are priorities that, again, the, those, the child tax credit, the, the three main business tax uh, extenders, uh, the amortization of research and development uh, expenses, uh, the uh, Section 163J uh, limitation on uh, deducting debt, you know, sort of adding back depreciation and amortization as part of calculating the 30% limit, uh, and the step down and bonus depreciation. Those are all continuing priorities, and I imagine they will be. They t they, they they still need to figure out what iteration of uh, a child tax credit exp expansion is acceptable. I mean. For what it's worth, uh, Chairman Jason Smith has said he's willing to negotiate on uh, you know, a child tax credit. So that seems uh, somewhat positive for uh, uh, the uh, the possibility of, of an agreement there. But th that isn't a ne necessarily a key step because I see opportunity zones sort of being plugged in uh, once the, that big negotiation, uh, had, they get a sort of those sort of fundamental pillars uh, uh, the, of the agreement uh, in place, uh, uh, because I think that, that there is strong bipartisan support uh, for it. Uh, and is, this is probably one of the top priorities of Tim Scott, uh, you know, a, a senior uh, Senate Finance Committee member and, and the banking, uh, uh, the top Republican on the banking committee. Uh, so uh, I, I think there's a good chance. And, and there are other community development uh, tax proposals that I think maybe uh, a part of that year-end tax legislation, such as uh, uh, proposals on the low-income housing tax credit uh, uh, to create a new neighborhood homes uh, tax credit, which would be a single-family uh, um, uh, credit for owner-occupied housing, uh, and, and potentially even uh, a, a making permanent the, the new markets tax credit, uh, which is often you know compared with opportunity zones as a similar way to bring private capital into low-income communities. So those are all, I think, potentially at the mix uh, for a year in negotiation. And I think uh, it would be uh, very much up to zones has a, a clear sort of pathway once that big agreement. But I will say, as we hinted there, who may be a potential barrier there. I say the biggest challenge we have is Senate Finance Committee Chairman Ron Wyden from Oregon. He has been a little bit of a skeptic. He sent out letters to various uh, opportunity uh, uh, funds uh, and uh, he has concerns uh, and uh, um, he you know, has introduced legislation in the past uh, with reforms to uh, the Opportunity Zones incentive. So I think for those Opportunity Zone stakeholders in Oregon, I think it's going to be crucial uh, for them to reach out to their Senator and say, you know, here's what we could do if this opportunity zone legislation were, uh, uh, you know, to be enacted. This is the type of project we'd love to continue to invest in Oregon, uh, uh, but we're being held back because, you know, while 2026 might seem a long ways off to Congress, it's not for, you know, opportunity zone stakeholders. They're making decisions now uh, uh, that. Uh, will be where those deadlines will be uh, uh, crucial. So I think that's going to be a key thing that needs to happen. You're going to need to, to uh, uh, convince uh, the, the chairman of the finance committee that this needs to advance 
Uh, and uh, if we do that, then I think that that would be the biggest obstacle uh, to be overcome. You know, yeah. an interesting anecdote from the uh, Treasury report that I mentioned earlier is 76 percent of Oregon's opportunity zones have received investment and hmm. it's second on the list. I mean, so it's uh, it's not like they're not getting investment. So that's that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a that's a great stat to point out yeah. there, John. And, and yeah, the, the fact of the matter is this is a perishable tax incentive then, you know, for better or worse, Every day that goes by, the the incentive becomes a little bit less and less valuable as that deferral date draws nearer. The ten year benefit is is still huge, of course, but the the deferral benefits are are shrinking uh, as each day goes by, and we've already lost on the the step up in basis benefits of of ten and fifteen percent. Unless the opportunities on reform legislation were to pass at some point this year, hopefully. And extend those dates outward a little bit, and you know. So you know, Peter hinted at this. You know, OZ stakeholders, especially if you're doing development that's you know adhering to the the spirit of policy. You know, what to whatever extent you can publicize those stories and and tell those stories. And hey, if they happen to be in Oregon, and can maybe convince a senator there, all the better, I think, to help advance this legislation. Hey, Peter, is there anything else you're keeping an eye on that may impact? Opportunity zones. There's been some uh, chatter lately about uh, the Community Reinvestment Act and some some regulations being reformed there. What can you tell us about CRA? Sure thing. And I, I want to encourage. By the way, I know it seems like November is a far way off, but once that bill is introduced, we want to encourage your member of Congress to co-sponsor. We certainly want all members that we can, not only ones who co-sponsored uh, in the last Congress, but uh, others, because the more co-sponsors we have. The greater chance that that legislation will be uh, uh, included in any year-end bill. But uh, on the uh, on your point about the Community Reinvestment Act, this has been a long-standing, uh, 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 you know, a priority of the federal banking regulators. You know, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the uh, Federal Reserve, and the uh, uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. They, you know, they oversee the nation's banks, and the Community Reinvestment Act is a really key piece of legislation for, you know, community development, uh, investment and lending, uh, you know, about $200 billion a year is uh, largely motivated um, by the Community Investment Act. Uh, and they're going through this process to totally rewrite uh, the regulations. This is, they haven't gone under a fundamental uh, rewrite since 1995. And you can imagine what banking was like in 1995 versus what it is today, there's a lot been changed. Uh, so the, the last May, all of the those federal banking regulators did release a proposed set of regulations. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was talk at one point that they were going to try to get a uh, final set of regulations uh, published uh, by the end of this of last year. It didn't happen, obviously. And so it slipped into the you know first half of this year. Uh, but they, they, they potentially could have uh, a huge impact, you know, uh, on, uh, first of all, recognizing opportunity zones, of course, wasn't in existence in 1995. Uh, so we want to make sure that the, that uh, the regulations are rewritten to consider that. And it could give uh, clear clarity on how uh, banks could get uh, CRA credit for both, not only any uh, opportunity zone equity investments done, uh, but also lending quite, you know, I think even more powerfully because while banks maybe have only episodic capital gains, they lend all the time and the fa favorable lending terms may make a huge difference uh, towards uh, making, you know, opportunity zone uh, investment successful or not. So that's something we're definitely, the opportunity zones working group did submit comments and uh, uh, we're hopeful that those final regulations will, will give some clarity there. Yeah, that would help potentially unlock a, a, a huge source of capital for Opportunity Zone projects to to, to get underway. Uh, well, gentlemen, really appreciate you joining me today. Thank you both so much for sharing your insights on, on Opportunity Zone equity raising and the legislation, where we are and, and where we're going here. Uh, before we head out, before we end our episode today, where can our audience of high net worth investors and advisors go to learn more about 
the professional services that Novogradic provides to the OZ industry? Uh, you can actually go to our website. It's www.novoco, N-O-V-O-C-O.com. We have an Opportunity Zones Resource Center on the website. Uh, all the latest news, uh, lots of guidance, and uh, even a fun list on there. Um, so uh, please do visit our Opportunity Zones Resource Center. And all that uh, equity raising data is available on there as well. Uh, and for our listeners and viewers, as always, I'll have show notes available for today's episode at opportunitydb.com slash podcast. And there I'll have links to all of the resources that John, Peter, and I discussed on today's show. And please also be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast listening platform to always get the latest episodes. John, Peter, again, thank you so much today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you.